With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for giving us the most precious thing you have, your time. And that's why we do what we do here. We turn down the noise of the news cycle, try to talk about the things that matter, try not to talk about things that don't matter, and try our best to discern the times. And we do that a couple different ways. One is talking to the knowledgeable guests. The other is trying to provide a little bit of a wider perspective than some other folks might have. Now, we do this a couple different ways. You know, we talk to people overseas we try to have a diversity in our guest list we also have a diversity in our story list there's a very interesting thing that's happened the last couple days and part of the problem with it is a perspective issue yes it's also a personal accountability issue but i want to address it this way something really interesting happened on social media over the weekend if you're on twitter which i am way too much self-admittedly uh you may have heard about the elon musk closing the deal now we've been covering this since it all started back in the spring it's been up and down but now it's done and elon musk now owns twitter which he paid way too much for and is going to have some problems with but we'll cover that at another time an interesting phenomenon happened a whole bunch of folks on twitter who are very concerned about things like shadow bans and censorship and you've heard all these buzzwords if you've been around social media for more than about 10 seconds especially if you do politics they started doing something kind of collectively it's funny how things get going virally they started retweeting their tweets before that may have gotten them in trouble or did get them in trouble or did get them put in what we call twitter timeout or get their accounts taken down or suspended briefly well, let's just stop right there for a second and if this is something toddlers and teenagers do. You say something that you know you shouldn't say, but you say it anyway to see if you get away with it. That's basically what they're doing. Like, oh, well, it's free speech. Yeah, we'll debate free speech another time. Look, you click the consent button. It's a private platform. So no, you don't have free speech, but we'll hash that out some other time. These folks thought the most important part of this story, and when they saw the news of what was going on with a major media platform, and by the way, if you've got a social media account, you are a medium platform, even if it's only for your friends and family. You might want to keep that in mind. They thought the best way to react to that news was to push the limits of what they could do or re-up something they got in trouble for before and go, yay, I can do this thing I knew I shouldn't have done the first time because I'm doing it again just to see if I can get away with it. That sounds like a teenager or a toddler or an adolescent thing to do. But they praised themselves for this and they were happy about it. What does that tell us about folks? Now, we could talk about immaturity and things like that, but I think it's more of a perception problem. What do I mean by that? Well, social media has a way of tunnel visioning us. Somebody used the uh, metaphor, and I don't know who it is, but this is not mine, so I'd like to credit somebody else, of silos, like the old missile silos in the Cold War. You're all in your own little missile silos, and you don't really know what's going on other than waiting for the call to launch your missile at somebody. That kind of works. More importantly, though, we tunnel vision. We can select, we can use social media like a buffet and only get the information we want. We can curate our follows and we can curate what we see and hear and only eat what we want to eat and only see what we want to see and only hear what we want to hear. And the problem with tunnel vision when it comes to social media is a platform that can give you a global perspective and you can talk to anybody in the world at any time all of a sudden becomes the telescope looking through the wrong end, seeing everything distortedly, and only seeing what you want to see. Here's a couple examples of perspective I talked to. So while this was all going on over the weekend, over in Seoul at a Halloween party, over 150 people were killed in a crush. Now, if 150 people died in a crush in America, it'd be the lead story for four weeks or more. Just over the last 24 hours or so as I sit and record this, a pedestrian bridge in India collapsed. 132 people at this time died. There may be more because there was 400 people on this pedestrian bridge when it collapsed. We know about the war in Ukraine, the high casualties, the civilian casualties, the war crimes, 
the brutal price people are paying there. Even in our own country, there's so many stories that go misreported. We just re-upped uh, a few weeks ago our story from last year from our very good friend Molly McCluskey, who went out on the reservations and was trying to do a story on these missing persons. And she couldn't get anybody. She details this. Go listen to the episode. It's amazing. She details trying to sell this story and then trying to just get it published and then finally trying to give away this feature story about these missing persons out on the reservations. You know when all of a sudden they wanted it? After Gabby Petito happened. Now all of a sudden missing persons are hot and they got a backlash. And now they wanted to talk about missing persons of other kinds other than who Gabby Petito was because now people wanted to pay attention to it. Perspective. This applies to our politics, too. Yes, for the we're in the sprint now to finish off the midterm, so it's going to be hot and heavy. In fact, we're going to have multiple of our election experts on the next couple of programs because we want to cover it thoroughly from a couple different angles. That's why we have different people on to cover it, though. Even those things, you need a little bit of perspective. I was went and voted over the weekend. We have early voting here, and I've got some appointments and things, so I went and voted over the weekend. I was really struck by something when I went to vote. On my ballot, almost eh, three quarters of the ballot was not those top line things that we talk about on the show or other shows or even the political media widely. Three quarters of my ballot was judges. And then there were some local races, especially a county commissioner race, because the way it's set up where I live, you uh, vote for three at a time at an at large bid. So there was races that don't get covered. And I did what I usually do. I did a little bit of prep work, so I knew who I was going to vote for. But it struck me, I wonder how many people go to their voting booth and have no idea who all these judges and county commissioners and school board members and things like that even are. Because we tunnel vision. We focus on the president. We focus on Senate races. We focus on House races. And we should. There's nothing wrong with that. Or we focus on the queen's death or on a celebrity, whatever's viral at the moment. And then these people locally that have great effect on our lives, judges who have literally the power of life and death in your hands, do we pay as much attention to them? Do we pay attention to death and tragedy in other parts of the world? Or should we just keep re-upping the worst tweet we could think of that got us in trouble and re-up it again to make sure everybody knows that we said it and maybe we'll get away with it this time? There's immaturity there. There's childishness there. Mostly, though, there's just a lack of perspective. There's way more important things going on than what you do on social media. But you can change your social media to make it really about the important things. I try and sometimes fail to do that. But I do try. And I think we'd have a lot better social media. And we'd have a lot better news media, which flows from social media more and more these days, if we all did a little bit more of that. Get a wider perspective. Don't tunnel vision. Pay attention to what's going on in the whole world. Don't be afraid of outside opinion to shape what your perspective a little bit. Let's all try to do a little bit better going forward, especially as we finish off this midterm and immediately go into a presidential cycle and into the 2023 year of our Lord. Because we're almost done with the year of our Lord 2022. You don't want to finish it with regrets, folks. More hotel right after this. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. 
Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Ah, uh, welcome back to Hurt Tell. Okay, she was not nice to me off air on email. She's like, are you sure you want to talk about this again? I'm like, no, but we have to because y'all keep doing it up there. Our friend who covers Alaska, Alaska Policy Institute, a whole lot of other stuff, although she's physically sitting in Montana. Well, you just pick like the most beautiful states to hang out in. It's amazing. Sarah Montabano is back on the program again. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing better than y'all's ranked choice voting. What is going on? You you and your spectator piece, we've linked to it. Uh, you just come right out and call it the shambles that it is here. Uh, I'll use your verbiage. Uh, Alaska's ranked choice voting was a fiasco. And that places like Nevada should take note. We've gone over this a little bit, so let's let's just start with the big picture part of this. The uh, is it an idea problem or was it an execution problem or some ratio thereof? This is definitely a structural problem with ranked choice voting. Um, you know, fair vote and progressive cheerleaders like those organizations. Um, they say that it mitigates vote splitting, uh, minimizes strategic voting and even reduces political polarization. Uh, But the truth is that all of these things are baked into the process, and I think it makes it a lot worse than a single vote system. Now, part of the problem here was you had, of course, um, the long-term congressman died in the middle of this. So you have back-to-back elections for the same seat, which really confused everybody on a lot of levels. You've also talked about just physically here. The way the ballot was laid out was kind of a mess. The fact that you're voting on, you know, to fill the seat and then you're turning around and voting for the longer term, basically at the same time with a couple weeks difference. Just the mechanics of this thing got really messed up. And I know people want to talk about the political theory and rank choice voting and the pros and cons of it. Just the basics of filling out the ballot and getting it in people's hands to vote. That's the simple part of this that really seemed to fail and break down before you get to any of the theory, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it was extremely confusing, I think, for a lot of people. And what's worse is that on August 16th, the general election for the special race for House uh, was on the backside of the ballot, which had all the primary elections, which were choose one for November that were coming up on here. Um, So this whole special election situation was a a really odd first test of ranked choice voting in Alaska. Uh, And that was complicated by Al Gross, the nonpartisan candidate who got the third most votes in the primary. He dropped out. And so there were only three candidates on the uh, special election ballot rather than uh, four. So it was really interesting. Uh, Just logistically, there were a lot of wrenches thrown in this time around. Yeah. Now, on the political side of this, of course, the big name was Sarah Palin trying to do a comeback. Al Gross is known from the last cycle. We'll set him aside for the minute. Mary Potola is the one who came out of this thing. She came out even stronger in the second part of the voting. So she seems pretty secure now. Democrat. Now, Alaska has always been a little. Let's just be fair. Y'all a little weird politically uh, for good reason. It's just different up there. Mm hmm. What does people want to draw this out and make? Is there really a lesson to learn here, or is this something that's going to be unique to not just Alaska being a little bit different, but also the chaos of this election on top of it? How strong of a candidate is she really? Is she going to have staying power when they kind of figure this out and we have a more quote unquote normal election, whatever that means here in two years when she comes up again? Yeah, so she's actually on the ballot this November, and we're basically rerunning the same House race uh, with the fourth uh, candidate being libertarian Chris Bai. Um, so we were looking again at Palin, Begich, Peltola, and Bai. And, you know, the early polling says Peltola's, you know, getting, you know, 45% or so of first choice votes. And then, you know, that Chris Bai, he might be knocked out first. His votes will get split uh, probably mostly till Peltola, and that almost gets her to where she needs to be for a majority. Um, so I think, you know, she really wasn't well known in Alaska before uh, she was, you know, put up on this this election, this early special election ballot. Um, and I think people really rallied behind her, especially because Gross dropped out and he endorsed her and he's not running again in November. So that's that's a big part of it, I think. 
uh, she'll be able to perhaps keep her seat, which is going to be odd to have a Democratic representative from Alaska. But we've always been a little independent minded. Speaking of independent minded, you got a quasi independent senator who ducked into this race in the last few days. Uh, Lisa Murkowski, who's always been a little bit of an odd duck politically. Of course, again, it's Alaska. It's just different. Um, of course, we know she's had her fights. She's very much a centrist in whatever way you want to define that word. She basically came out and endorsed Patola, and they seem to be working. To, they have at least some kind of a public communication relationship, whether it's for their own good or their own political purposes or whatever. This is a real thing. They they have talked. They came out publicly. What does that do to this race, and what does that do going forward for both of them? Because, you know, Lisa Murkowski is, of course, the name out of Alaska politics now with Don Young died. What do you make of that? That's an interesting question. I think Murkowski has always known that under ranked choice voting, she's going to do very well. I wrote an article for The Spectator World um, basically outlining how she doesn't really need the Alaska Republican Party to like her or... or uh, endorse her in any sense um, in order to possibly win this election. And early polling says she's doing very well. Um, you know, Democrats are going to, Democrats that are supporting Piltola anyway are likely to give a first or cho second choice vote to Murkowski uh, because they know that she's a very crucial swing vote um, in the Senate there. And, um, you know, I think Peltola is getting a lot of cred for bipartisanship from this too. Uh, that, you know, Republicans looking at their representatives might say, gosh, I really don't like Sarah Palin. I don't really know about Nick Begich, uh, but, you know, Peltola's gotten this endorsement. Maybe she'll be able to work across the aisle. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the idea behind that strategy. Sarah Montalbana joining us, of course, a Young Voices contributor, Alaska Policy Institute. Love talking to her. She goes all the way back to our radio days before we were actually even doing her tell. You're one of my original radio guests. You've been around for a little while. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the ranked choice part of this for just a second, though. A lot of people endorse this as a theory. We talked about the practice of it was a little jacked up. All right, we have deemed you the election czar of ranked choice voting. Give us one or two things you would say that, uh, let's pick a state here. You're in Montana. Montana has decided to go to ranked choice voting. You're going to go, okay, but we saw what happened in Alaska. You need to make sure you fix what? Give us one or two of the top line items of what you got to make sure you get right if you're going to do ranked choice voting. That's an interesting question, too. The biggest problem with ranked choice voting is the fact that you can, it, it's a political science question really, Rank, ranking your favorite candidate higher can actually hurt them. And that's not a good uh, trait of any election system. You don't want to have to think counterintuitively of, well, you know, if I rank my candidate higher, is that going to actually, you know, knock them out sooner or something like that? Um, and so I would love to see you know, if we can't go back to one person, one vote, something like that. Um, if ranked choice voting could be fixed that, you know, anytime you rank your candidate, your favorite candidates higher, that that's good for them. And uh, that, that would be really something I'd like to see, because I think the, the strategizing that voters have to do uh, in order to really uh, mobilize and, and think strategically about this is too much. It's, it's yeah. not fair. Yeah, in your piece in The Spectator, you called it that it was unfair, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here for, for brevity. You said it was unfair to have voters having to figure out game theory. Yes. If, if we're going to have a basis system of one person, one vote, which has kind of been the foundational to representative democracy in America since the beginning, <laughs> disenfranchise is too strong of a word. Because, and by the way, Alaska chose, uh, y'all chose this. You wanted to do this. The state, nobody's. Oh, well, I mean, it, it, yeah. that's how elections work, though. You win or you don't. Yeah, Y'all chose to do this, but it does seem like, and I don't want to insult voters either, so we need to have a better way to discuss this. 
but you shouldn't have to have a scratch pad to go to vote for somebody. In my opinion, my humble but accurate opinion, you shouldn't, you know, flipping over a ballot to get to the other part of the ballot. That's I mean, sometimes it's necessary. I know our municipal elections, we have to do that. That seems like it seems like we're adding stuff on the voter that's making it unfair to the voter to make the basic decision of who they want to vote for. Is that a fair way to put it? Absolutely. We need to think about that. Not only do voters have to do the research on all of these different candidates, they're not just coming out at the end and saying, this is the person I like. They have to decide how they rank these different people by preference. And, and that can sometimes be a very easy choice, um, but that's that's not necessarily. And then you have to think about what's going on on the rest of the ballot. I mean, you're looking at judicial uh seats, yes or no, a, a bunch of those. You're looking at ballot initiatives. You're looking at several different races, four candidates each. It just really starts to multiply the amount of research that voters have to do. Um, and sometimes that's not easily available to them. Um, you just get what, you know, is sent out in your ballot book. You know, this is what your candidate wants you to know. Uh, and so that's that's not always an easy process. And asking ranked choice voting to really not only do your research and figure out who you like the most, uh, but how you rank the rest of them. It's a difficult question. Yeah, Sarah Montalban joining us. Uh, you phrase this because you wrote this, you know, writing device, kind of talking to Nevada because Nevada is going to have this on the ballot. Nevada is very interesting. It's very much a swing state. It's a changing state. The demographics are changing. I know the state well. I lived in Las Vegas for several years. They're also an early primary state for both parties in the presidential elections. Okay. Now, now, Alaska getting it is one thing because Alaska, and I don't mean this insulting at all, it is a bit of an outlier. Y'all up there by yourself. You have different kind of politics. We're always last to submit our votes. <laughs> yeah, but it's an but it's an outlier and it's not. Nevada is a big, big deal when you come to things like presidential elections. It's a big I'm worried you're going to wind up if they if they do this and they don't do it correctly. And Nevada's got some real challenges, I'll say, because, you know, it is Vegas and then it's the rest of the state um, and Reno to a little bit lesser extent. There's a lot of rural. The federal government owns like 80, 90 percent of the state of Nevada. It's a strange state politically. But. I'm really worried if they do a ranked choice system voting and then you go into a presidential year, we're going to get into a mess like we had in Iowa in 2020. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair concern to have? Is that something places like Nevada, Nevada, obviously the voters need to consider it, but if the voters decide to do this, the people that actually do elections are really going to have to bear down and make sure they have something that's operable and practical to make the election work. And that's what you're really driving at with trying to warn them, isn't it? Definitely. It's it's a huge logistical problem. And I would remind Nevada that if you're looking to be leading these things, Alaska, we didn't tabulate our results until two weeks after. And that's a pretty standard timeline for ranked choice voting uh, because you have to look at any hand counted ballots. You have to do at the actual tabulations. Um, so, you know, kiss election night results goodbye honestly. <laughs> yeah. And Nevada's <laughs> coming from a, challenge. yeah. And they're going to be coming from a caucusing system, which is what drove it. Cause they're like, we don't want to do a caucus anymore. They're going to be picking between an open primary and ranked choice voting. So it's not like a yes or no on ranked choice. They're going to be picking between the open primary as well, which by the way, has its own pros and cons. We'll save that for another time. Sarah Montabano yes. joining us. Um, big picture though. Looks like Murkowski's pretty much entrenched for however long she wants to stay. There was a lot of, you know, because she fought with Trump and stuff, there was some back and forth about her being in danger. I think that's passed now. Um, Don Young passed away, so obviously that's gone. Outside of Murkowski, though, what's the state of Alaska's politics? It's always been kind of contrarian. It's all It doesn't always neatly break down party lines. There's obviously that independent spirit streak that's required if you're going to live in Alaska in the first place. What's kind of the future politically of the state? It's not really a swing state. It's not really a blue red state in the traditional sense. Just give people in the lower 48 a little sense of where you think this is going the next couple of years. Absolutely. Alaska tends to be fairly Republican in um, localities, in the governor and, and a lot of, you know, different offices at the local level. Um, what we mostly see is that Anchorage drags along the rest of the state with um, blue, blue policies and um, politicians and stuff like that. 
And so it's it's not the maggot type republicanism because Alaska depends so much on natural resources and getting these federal um, getting these federal bills through that allow you know natural resource development and federal leases and things like that. And so you know any politician that wants to survive in D.C. Uh, needs to kind of do what Don Young does did um, and, you know, bring home pork barrel projects that are necessary um, for Alaska. And so I don't think that's going to change. I think Murkowski, Peltola, whoever is eventually in these seats is going to have to do a lot of that. Um, and I don't see that changing. Is this the last we see of Sarah Palin on the state and national stage, you think? Oh, boy, I don't know. I think a lot of Alaskans hope that it is, um, but it is difficult. I just, I'm not seeing the hard campaigning that she did for the special election. I'm not seeing so much of that in the lead up to November 8th um, coming up. But, you know, it's it's very possible that she'll disappear for 10 years. It's very possible that she will consider running for another office in 2024 or 2026. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> have to wait and see. One thing we know, we will continue to have Sarah Montabano on the program. We love talking to her. Uh, Give folks a chance to follow you, what you've got going on, some of your writing you got going on, your Young Voices work, your policy work, till they see you again on Hertel. Let them know how to keep up with you. Absolutely. You should find me at www.alaskapolicyforum.org. Uh, you'll find my writings about education. I'm actually an education policy analyst, not elections. Um, and uh, I, you can also find me on my Young Voices talent page where I'm the Northwest Regional Leader for Young Voices. Yeah, because there's nothing going on in education right now. We actually, I, I, we're going to have you back on to talk a little education because some of the new numbers that are coming out are just startling. But uh, it's election season, so you got to get the election out of the way. So you're doing good work doing double duty, my friend. Sarah Montabano, always enjoy talking. Thank you for the time today. It's a delight. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ah, welcome back to Hertel. Okay, he's back. He's been here before. We always enjoy having Charles Brand with us. How are you, sir? Welcome back to Hertel. I'm doing great, Andrew. How are you doing this fine day? Uh, better than some of these folks in California that's dealing with yet another piece of regulatory uh, headache that we got to deal with here. You were writing about it. You wrote about it in uh, the OC Register. Big picture wise, what is it about California that they're always tweaking with regulatory law when it comes to labor? This is what the third or fourth bill in as many years. It's kind of along these same line. This, this is habit. I know it's a blue state. I know it's a progressive state in the power structures of the city, even though there's enclaves that are red. This sure seems to be like a song that we've sung before, my friend. It absolutely is, and you hit the nail right on the head. California is a deep blue state with a deep blue legislator and a deep blue governor. Um, so, so long as both houses of the California legislator are on board and, and Gavin Newsom, who is, is oftentimes loath to disagree with the legislator, uh, you're gonna have legislation, regardless of the fact of how far reaching or radical it is relative to the other states in the union. And notwithstanding the fact that the regulatory consequences are oftentimes fairly grim for the people that the legislator claims uh, to uphold and cherish through legislation of this kind. So you're absolutely right. It's par for the course for California. Um, and it's not all too common uh, given the, the kind of uh, unipolar uh, political landscape out in the Golden State. Okay, so this thing is called the FAST Recovery Act. FAST being an acronym, that means it's all capitalized, means those words mean something else. I, I know we fiddle with the names here, but break down for folks. Let's before we get into what it actually does. What is it intended to do? Like if it was in a perfect world in a vacuum, the people that propose this legislation, it magically waves a wand and solves what? So it is a bill that establishes a wage council. It's a commission of sorts uh, with with ten members many if not all of whom are appointed by Governor Newsom and some of which have to come from 
the restaurant industry, some of which have to come from the union um, uh, walk of life. So there are certain parameters as to who can serve on the commission. Um, but it is a commission established for the sole purpose of, uh, and I quote the legislation here directly, uh, establishing sector-wide minimum standards on wages, working hours, and other working conditions adequate to ensure and maintain the health, safety, and welfare of, and to supply the necessary cost of uh, proper living to fast food restaurant workers and to ensure and affect intra-agency cooperation and prompt agency responses regarding issues affecting the health, safety, and employment of fast food restaurant workers. It is essentially a regulatory blank check um, for this 10 member commission to set in place uh, labor laws for a very specific industry, that being the fast food industry. Uh, of course, the legislators' um, favorite friends uh, are immunized from the council's regulatory onslaught, and we'll get into that in a minute. But in essence, there is this commission, it will be regulating labor laws, but only with respect to fast food industry workers. And this commission is empowered with substantial discretion to, to set the standards as it sees fit, though there are some parameters, for instance, um, as it's starting out, it can only go as high as $22 an hour with respect to the minimum wage. And I imagine there are other uh, broad parameters with respect to working conditions. But uh, the point uh, it, it is all the same. The discretion of this commission to regulate the working standards of fast food industry workers is substantial. Okay, Charles Brand joining us. It's not that this sector doesn't need regulation, because it does. It's not that it's a sector that isn't a high priority in our economy, because the service sector industries like fast food workers are having both labor problems and shortages at the same time, even though unemployment's long. That's all valid. My concern here is I'm not necessarily anti-union. Uh, I come from West Virginia. If anybody ever needed a union, it was the coal miners. They needed a union. My problem with the modern version of the American union is it gets too cuddly with the U.S. government. Originally, unions were just as much against the government as they were for the workers and against the companies. Because my concern here is when you have the unions, which is what this commission is going to be stacked full of people, union and union adjacent. Let's all be adults here. And you have the government working hand in hand. If the workers got a problem with the union or the government, then where do they go? That's a great question. Uh, I, I guess they can look inward <laughs> for themselves and ask for, for, for personal advice and counsel. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's been increasingly common, especially in democratic, uh, the circles of democratic politicians, for unions to have an outsized influence on policymaking. Um, on the national stage, an example is uh, one of the presidents of one of the biggest teachers unions, Randy Weingarten, is currently out in Ukraine uh, doing God knows what. I'm not sure even in what capacity she's over there. PR. But she, PR is the word you're looking for. Yes, Andrew. I was, I was, I guess, trying to be a bit kinder than you. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, but, you know, it, it's, yes, the union influence, especially in democratic policy circles, is massive, and it should come as no surprise, uh, given the fact that public sector unions, especially, are uh, in the pocket of today's Democratic Party and are a powerful and, and financially capable constituency of theirs that, uh, that uh, in the view of many, has has gotten them across the finish line in pivotal elections far and wide. Uh, so it is absolutely a problem, and there is this increasing trend toward governmental collusion with the private sector um, as a means of advancing goals that undercut the bottom line of the common man. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played.
Charles Brandt joining us. This bill actually is the final form of a couple other things. You detail this in your piece as well. This came out of the Fight for 15 stuff. This came out of originally this legislation was aimed uh, very narrowly directly at fast food workers. It's been expanded out a little bit. Talk about the path, because I think one thing we skip with re- with legislation and regulation like this, we get that line item at the end, like, oh, $22 minimum wage. That's what they're doing. The path that a piece of legislation like this takes actually tells you more about the intention and what it might do and where it might grow from, because we understand something like a commission They're not going to stop expanding their power. They're going to keep pushing the limits of that power. I think the course of how this came into being is very important to understand where this might be going in the long term. And you touch on that. Well, as you mentioned previously, you know, it was kind of a generic push for 15. uh, And I imagine it wasn't just in California, but across many states in the union. Um, And now all of a sudden we've gone up to 22. But the legislator, I think, is being very clever here. Rather than simply pass into a law, into law a, a $22 minimum wage and, and face the voters uh, in November, um, they have kind of put a middleman in between the voter um, and the legislator. And that, of course, is this wage council. So um, I think the commission idea is relatively novel. Um, And it's a strategic way for the legislator to punt the issue to a commission. A very wise man once said, uh, you know, you form a commission when you want something to go and die there. Well, in this particular instance, um, I I believe the legislator would like the commission to be successful in in setting more onerous working conditions, uh, working standard conditions uh, for fast food industry workers and, and a higher minimum wage. But by handing the baton off to a commission, it's escaping immediate political accountability. The legislator could simply say, oh, well, the commission set the minimum wage to be X and they're chock full of experts uh, and industry leaders. Who are we to disagree with uh, such a bureaucratic masterpiece? So I, I, I think it's strategic. It's something we see at the federal level as well. Congress passes these really, really vague laws with these insanely broad, um, delegations of power to agencies. Those agencies then are granted discretion by the federal courts uh, in, in interpreting their own statutes generally. Uh, and so they're interpreting broad delegations of power very broadly and oftentimes without respect to the context uh, in which the law was originally enacted. Um, so with respect to your original question, I think what we're seeing here is a shift away from the legislator doing something directly and handing it off to a commission as a means, I suspect, of escaping political accountability. Yeah, Charles Brand joining us. There's two pieces of criticism for this. You already talked about the first one, that it's basically a backdoor minimum wage raise without going through the process to do so. The other is uh, the concern from some critics is that this is part of a larger effort to unionize the entire restaurant industry. Now, there's no secret that they would love to unionize the entire restaurant industry. There's some caveats to that. The the restaurant industry works heavily on part-time workers. It works on seasonal workers. It works on peak hour workers is a big thing in the service industry, especially fast food industry, because they want people that work peak hours. That means usually people that have certain home circumstances where they can do things like that. These are not things that traditionally go well with a union, but there's a push for a unionization. Talk about how that force and that metric and that dynamic can change something like the fast food industry, which has always been more entry level, has been more flexible hours, both to its detriment of the workers. And and I'm not saying they shouldn't do some reform on that because the way they jerk their hours away is not fair. Completely understand that. But it does seem to be that they're trying to slam the same old square peg union thing into the very round hole, whether it's actually going to fit or not, without any idea of whether it's going to fit or not. Right. Um, I mean, several CEOs who who fall under the unfortunate purview of this wage council have come out and said, hey, uh, in the short term, we're going to have to pass this on to consumers, uh, the, the increased prices. Um, as a result of all these regulations and these new minimum wages, we will have to pass the prices on to consumers. That means less demand uh, for these fast food um, services or food rather, I should just say fast food, food. Um, 
And, uh, you know, ultimately it's going to affect the company's bottom line. It could uh, force them to hire fewer workers. Uh, it, it could um, compel them to invest in robotic capital instead of, uh, you know, actual human beings on the working line because they've made the, the financial calculation that it's simply cheaper to invest in robotic capital uh, as opposed to pay 22 up to $22 an hour um, for a worker that the market has not valued at $22 an hour. Um, so it could uh, eliminate permanently jobs that um, many you know, high schoolers or, or younger individuals work uh, as their first job, either out of high school or during high school. A lot of those jobs might not exist anymore with regulations like these forcing companies to pay a wage that is just simply not profitable for them. Uh, so it, it, it ultimately it is likely to have effects that are detrimental to the very workers um, who the legislator claims um, it is here attempting to uphold. Yeah, and the other part of this, Charles Brand joining us, everybody wants, it's it's easy to take a shot at a company like McDonald's, huge company, the standard bear in fast food for however many years. But the problem is McDonald's doesn't run all the restaurants. These are franchi franchisee owners. So these are actually small business owners, even though it's a McDonald's mega corporation brand. California has a history of this. We saw this with the truck driver regulation where they didn't do a carve out for third party lease owner operators. And we see what happens at the ports where they basically made it illegal instead of doing well, we needed to do a carve out for that specific group. This feels like one of those things where maybe they're getting way too broad a brush instead of distinguishing. They don't distinguish between a Starbucks and a McDonald's and a Chipotle. They don't distinguish between fast casual and more fine dining. They're not distinguishing between a mega corporation where that argument, even though I still disagree with it, the argument of not passing the buck on would have more validity and these small business owners that are franchisees on it. This seems like a way too broad a brush to me on a practical level. Does it to you as well? It's certainly a broad brush, but what I find especially interesting in regulations of this sort um, is where the legislator has immunized its friends uh, from from the onerous regulations. So there are two specific exceptions uh, in the Fast Recovery Act, which stands for the Fast Food Accountability and Standards Recovery Act, uh, also known as Assembly Bill 257. There's uh, what, I, what I've coined as the Panera exception. Um, so uh, one provision in this statute provides, and I quote, an establishment that on September 1st, 2022 operates a bakery that produces for sale on the establishment's premises, bread, and I'm skipping ahead a bit, shall not be considered a fast food restaurant so long as it continues to operate such a bakery. This exemption applies only where the establishment produces for sale bread as a standalone menu item and does not apply if the bread is available for sale solely as part of another menu item. Um, so that's the first exception, which is kind of mind boggling in a sense. I think the plain meaning of the term fast food encapsulates the likes of Panera, um, whose food is well fast. And it's generally considered, though you can sit down and eat there much like at a McDonald's. I mean, it is, I mean, it's on all fours with your kind of prototypical fast food joint. Um, for some reason, the legislator has said, eh, no, Panera's fine. We don't need to regulate Panera. Uh, I honestly can't think of a single reason uh, why, as, you know, especially in light of the um, purpose, the, the, the putative purpose set forth in the legislator, which um, in the preamble of the act recites, um, for years, the fast food sector has been rife with abuse, low pay, few benefits, and minimal job security. 
with California workers subject to high rates of employment violations, including wage theft, actual, sexual harassment, and discrimination, as well as heightened health and safety risks. Well, I, I really can't see how that purpose is any less applicable to Panera Bread uh, as to McDonald's or Chipotle. Um, so there's that. There's another arbitrary exception, which seems, uh, you know, what McDonald's CEO said is it's, it's really, you know, that these exceptions are the outcome of a backdoor politicking. Um, and I, I certainly agree with that assessment. But this particular exception um, provides, and I quote, fast food chains, chain, excuse me, means a set of restaurants consisting of 100 or more establishments nationally that share a common brand uh, or that are characterized by standardized options for decor, marketing, packaging, products, and services. So if you uh, uh, are working at a, for a chain, that only has, you know, let's say 100 um, restaurants nationally, you will not fall under uh, the, the jurisdiction of this, this commission. But God forbid you have 101, uh, in which case you are at the mercy of this ultra powerful regulatory bureaucracy. Um, so it, 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 it's arbitrary exemptions like these that raise eyebrows, so to speak, and make me, uh, as a prospective lawyer, uh, uh, question the, 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 the purported reasons for this legislation, or rather how sincere the legislator was in its conviction that these regulations were so necessary as to mandate the creation of an ultra powerful commission. On the plus side, pretty soon you're going to be able to go in the subway and just buy the bread because they're going to want to get all on board with that. So they they will find ways around here. That's why I brought up the loopholes in the truck driver legislation, because every time they do one of these bills, it seems like they leave some kind of loophole that either makes it way worse or that people can exploit to get around what they wanted to do. Uh, Charles Brandt, great information on this, as always. Always appreciate your insight on it. It just seems like once a year we do this with California, like every, like literally once a year we do one of these bills. So I don't think they're going to quit doing it. And I think there's going to be some legal changes on what you just said, though, about the fact that they're they're doing some nationalizing regulation in the states and expect that to show up in the courts until uh, we get you back next time, my friend. Hopefully not talking about California, but something else. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you and keep up with you until we get you back on Hertel again. Of course. So you can follow me at uh, uh, Charlie Brandt 44 on Twitter, um, where I post my um, latest op ed pieces. Um, and and other other political takes. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity, Andrew, and and thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, we always enjoy having you on, my friend. He's at GW, uh, so pray for him as he navigates the utter wilds of DC. Uh, Charles Brandt, good friend of the program. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. As always, love to hear from you. Heard tell show at gmail.com. Send us an email. Heard tell show on the Twitter. You can DM us and follow us there. Also, my Twitter handle, Four for the Fire, and those of our guests is always in the lower third graphics. If you're watching on the YouTube, if you're listening on the podcast, there'll be links for you to follow both the writing of the folks we have on and us and our social media. This only works because you listen, and we so greatly appreciate you. So wherever you are, across the street or around the world, we hope you and yours are well. We hope you are well fed. We can't wait to see you again for more Hurt Tell. All the music on Hurt Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.